So good afternoon. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit of update on what we've been doing on, with our blue water allocation. And the name of our PRAC allocation is called Transformative Petascale Particle and Cell Simulation of Laser Plasma Interactions. And my name is Frank Tong. I'm one of the co-PIs of the project. The PI is Warren Mori, and I'd like to acknowledge the contributions from members of our team, including staff members Victor Desik and Wei Ming Lam, and postdocs Xin Lu Xu and Han Wen. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Galen, who is our contact at Blue Waters and other Blue Water consultants as well. So the talk is broken up roughly into four parts. Um, in the first part, I'm going to give you, I'm going to tell you what particle and cell simulation is, and show you our particular implementation of it called Osiris, and then I'm going to give you some updates on our physics results uh, for the two problems that we're concentrating on. Uh, on blue waters. One is that of the plasma-based accelerators, where in the past year we have um, used blue water time to study the feasibility of producing, of using plasma to, to produce high quality electron beams for the production of uh, ultra bright X-ray free electron lasers. And this work is being prepared for publication in Nature Physics. And for the second physics topic, I want to talk to you about laser fusion and what we've been doing the last year to add more realism into our 2D simulations and to study the effect of um, what we call temporal incoherence um, and using temporal incoherence to control LPIs in fusion plasmas. And I'm going to also, um, I'm going to show you some movies from our 2D simulations and give you some estimates uh, for th very large scale 3D simulations and to show you that 3D simulations relevant to laser fusion is simply not possible today and finally motivates you to the last part of my talk which is uh, on co-development and what we have been doing um, um, on multi-cores and GPUs. All right, so um, this is what particle and cell algorithms look like. I think um, since this is the end of the week so I'm not gonna go into this loop into too much detail. And just to say that um, the particle and cell method solves very fundamental laws of physics, such as Newton's equation and Maxwell's equations. So it's ideally suited for systems which are highly nonlinear, such as the ones that we'll be talking to you about today. And earlier this week, you've probably seen particle and cell methods being applied to uh, space plasmas as well. And also, and particle and cell simulations have been around for about 50 years, so these codes are very large and very mature. And there are hundreds of thousands of lines long, but really 90% um, of the execution time is spent in these four, these four subroutines in, in the code. And these, these routines accounts for about 2% of the code. So porting, optimization and porting of the particle and cell methods is fairly straightforward, but it's not always trivial, and that's, which is something I will be talking to you about toward the end of my talk. All right, so our particular version of, part of PEG is called Osiris. It's a code that's been jointly developed by UCLA and IST, and it's a very mature code that's been around for a long time and has many features. Of the features that's uh, most relevant to this audience is that we have shown Osiris to scale up to about 1.6 million cores, and it has dynamic low balancing, and it has a hybrid open MP and MPI parallelization, and we also have uh, branches uh, for CUDA and the Intel Phi that's been developed. All right, so let's move on to physics. So the first problem that I want to talk to you about today is that of plasma-based accelerators. So why plasmas? And what, what is plasma-based accelerators, and why do we use plasmas, right? So plasma-based accelerator usually consists of three parts. One is the driving bunch, and the driving bunch loses its energy and to produce plasma waves. And the trailing bunch, the trailing bunch, its main purpose is to pick out the energy uh, from the plasma waves and it accelerates. And the plasma acts as the go-between between, between the driving bunch and the trailing bunch. And there are two main types of plasma-based accelerators. One is called PWFA, or plasma wave, wake field accelerators. And that uses an electron beam as the driver. And the second flavor is called LWFA, or la laser wake field accelerators, and that uses a laser as the, driving, as the driving force. And so why do we use plasmas? And that can be answered if you look at the Livingston curve, which, tra which tracks the peak energy of accelerators from the invention of accelerators in 1930 at Berkeley, all the way up to today. And as you can see, conventional accelerators has set, had 
the peak energy has saturated since around 1980. And the reason for that is very simple, because energy is roughly force times distance. And right, so the amount of field that can be applied to conventional accelerators has roughly peaked since 1980. And the only way to get more energy out of conventional accelerators is uh, make it mar much larger and larger. So the current, the current largest accelerator, uh, LHC, is about 50 kilometers uh, long. So plasmas, however, can support fields which might, are much larger than conventional accelerators, and we've been doing experiments since the early 1980s. And it's here you can see uh, plasma basis, the progress of plasma-based accelerators since 1980 all the way up to today. And here on, on, on this plot, the red dots represents experiments done using laser drivers, and the blue dots here are experiments done using beam drivers. And on blue waters, we simulate both LWFAs and PWFAs, but today I'm going to concentrate my talk on PWFAs. So the PWFA experiments are mostly done at SLAC. So SLAC has, is no longer a, a facility to study high energy physics, but rather it's been converted into a light source called LCLS, or Linux Coherent Light Source. And our, f our experiment called FACET is located around it. So the entire accelerator structure is, is about three kilometers, and LCLS is located at the end of the, uh, uh, the beam line, uh, at the three kilometer mark. And there's an undulator, and that converts the, the electron or positron into hard X-rays. And the FACET facility is located at the two kilometer mark, where the uh, electrons and positrons are about 20 GeVs, uh, enters the plasma and is further accelerated. And Blue Waters has been, has been an integral part of the experimental effort at FACET. So these are all the experiment and simulation results that show, showed up in the publication Nature over the past 10 years. And due to time constraint, I'm not going to go over, over each one. So I'm just going to point out some highlights. So in 2007, we showed that if you take a 40 GeV electron beam that takes three kilometers of conventional accelerators to generate. You can double this energy using just one meter of plasma. So the energy doubling experiment in 2007 showed that um, plasma-based accelerators can generate fields as three orders of magnitude larger than conventional accelerators. And also the other highlight is that in 2014, simulation results done on blue water show up on the cover of nature. And due to time constraint, I'm not going to go over each of these simulation results in more detail. So in the past year, we're no longer interested in just accelerating particles to very high energy, but we are more interested in producing high quality electron beams that's, that's necessary to produce very coherent x-rays. So, so what is needed? So, why, so what is, what is x-ray FEL and why is it so important? So this can be explained if you look at the different light sources from the, around the world and plot it and show it in, in this following parameter space where you plot the x-axis is the energy of the photons and the y-axis is the brilliance of the, of the photon beam. And if you remember uh, from your quantum mechanics, the energy of the photons roughly translate to its wavelength. And the brilliance is just the, is a measurement of the coherence of these photons. So it's measured in terms of number of photons per, per area, per millimeter squared, and per second. And the sec so the second is roughly, roughly translates to the longitudinal distance. It's divided by the speed of light. So you can think of brilliance as the number of photons in a given volume. So you can see um, you can have lasers which produce very brilliant light, but at very low energy. So these so lasers are usually operate in the mi one micron range, or you can have synchrotron light sources which uh, operates at very high energy, but it's very incoherent. So X-ray FELs is unique in that it can produce light X-rays which is of the angstrom scale, and also it can resolve time scales on the femtosecond scale. So that's what's, and in 2009 when L LCLS first turned on, it is nine orders of magnitude brighter than uh, comparable synchrotron sources. And for the first time, we can measure, we can study things on the nuclear time scale, which is, uh, one, which is uh, one angstrom in wavelength and also uh, a pulse length of, 
a few femtoseconds. And so we like to do the same thing using a compact plasma source. And in the past year, we've been using our simulation tools to study whether or not these, um, this is possible. So because of the high resolution involved, the, these simulations are quite large. And that's, what, that's why Blue Waters is so useful, because these simulations take a lot of memory. And cannot, these simulations are hard to do elsewhere. So uh, here are the, the parameters of the beam and the simulation parameters of our typical simulation. So in these experiments, uh, we have a, a driving beam of, one, of 8 GeV and a trailing beam, so so 8 GeV. And the, the driving beam is around three times heavier than the, than the witness beam. And it propagates in a plasma of density seven times 10 to the 16th over a distance of about 1.5 meters. And the simulation parameters, roughly, we use about 16 billion grids and about 64 billion plasma electrons. And there are 4 million particles in both the driving bunch and the witness bunch. And this is about two orders of magnitude off from the number of real electrons in these bunches. So we're very close to doing one-to-one -one, uh, simulations. And this is the simulation result. And here, and this is what the, the witness beam looks like after 1.5 meters of in propagating inside the plasma. And you can see this is the final energy of the witness bunch. And the density, the, the beam profile is plotted in, in, the red, in the red dashed line. And you can see the, the witness beam is, is accelerated from, 6 G, from 8 GeV all the way up to 16 GeVs with a range of energies from 12 GeVs to 19 GeVs. However, uh, the energy spread of, of the witness bunch is around the, the order of 10 to the minus 4. Oops. And, this, and the, threshold, the threshold for, for lasing is 3 times 10 to the minus 4, uh, according to theorists. So our simulations show that um, electron beams produced by plasmas um, is coherent enough to produce uh, free electron lasers. And this, this work, and also, and also the transverse coherence or the admittance of the beam is preserved after 1.5 meters. And this is very encouraging result. And this is being prepared for publication by uh, Dr. Xu. All right, so the second problem I want to look at is that of laser fusion. So in laser fusion, lasers enter a target chamber called a hole round, and the laser line is converted into x-ray, and the x-ray is used to compress the target. And hopefully, we get more energy out than we, than we put into the laser. So in this case, the, the excitation of plasma wave by the laser is actually bad, and it's for two reasons. One, as, as you saw earlier, um, these lasers can accelerate electrons to very high energy. And this is bad because the electrons would then heat up the target. And the tar if you increase the temperature inside the target, then increases the kinetic pressure of the target, making it harder to compress. And the second thing is that the, if the light, when, once the light creates a plasma wave, the lines will be scattered, and the, the light will return to the source instead of propagating inward into the whole realm. So this is a very difficult problem because the length and time scale involved is is very large. The length scale involved spans about three orders of magnitude from one micron, which is the, the wavelength of the laser, to one millimeter, which is roughly the, the, the length of the beam path. And the time scale uh, spans from one femtosecond, which is roughly the period of the, of the laser, to a nanosecond, which is the duration of the pulse. So I, I, see, I, I see I don't have a lot of time here, so I'm going to skip ahead. Um, so in, in the past year, what we have done is that we have uh, added real, realistic beam effects into our lasers to study. So, so I mean, just go over this slide slightly. So you can see this problem is actually is, so the LPI problem is actually 3D in nature because the beam actually contains many of these fine structures called speckles. And we've been looking at uh, interactions of multiple speckles uh, for the past few years. And, this, and in the past year, we added realistic beam optics to actually model uh, real effects, such as ISI, called spa induced spatial incoherence, or SSD. And these are real sm beam smoothing techniques. And then we incorporated that into our PIC code. And 
All right. And here's a 2D simulation um, showing what laser plasma instability looked like with static speckle patterns shown on the left. And also now we have, and the, um, and the, two, and the two simulations on the right, we have lasers that's turned on and off periodically and lasers with um, speckle patterns that's random in time. And as you can see, the plasma wave activity is greatly reduced if you turn the laser on and off periodically at a rate which is comparable to the, to the gr uh, growth time of the laser plasma instabilities. And we have shown that if you turn the laser on and off fast enough or introduce enough temporal incoherence, uh, you can reduce uh, reflectivity by a factor of two. And this is, these are small scale simulations, each taking about a million CPU hours and only takes about, a, it's only the length of the simulation is about 100 microns, which is much less than the full beam path. And to do a 2D simulation along the full NIF beam path takes about 10, 10 million CPU hours. And similarly, if you want to do a single speckle simulation in 3D, it takes also takes about uh, 10 million hours. And if you want to do multiple speckle simulations in 3D, such simulations would take a billion hours or two months on the full blue water supercomputer, and that's simply not available today. So we've been working very hard to port our code into onto exascale supercomputers. And what is, how am I doing? Sorry, two minutes. Okay. So I'm going to try to wrap it up, and just to let you know that we've been we we have a prototype code running on the GPU, the skeleton code that's running on the GPU, and on the GPU we adapt. A, a local domain decomposition using the concept of tiles. And by using the concept of tiles, we have been able to um, do local domain decomposition with very little overhead, and we write our own particle manager, which manages the particle, the message passing inside the GPU. And on a single GPU, um, we achieve timings, which is about 50 times faster than that of a single, single Intel i7 core. And furthermore, we took the CUDA code and re rewrote it in OpenMP. And so using OpenMP parallelism and the same algorithm, we're able to get a speed up of 11.4 on a 12 core Intel i7. And furthermore, we have now, so we have now adopted this code to run on multiple GPUs and also, hey, Richard's here. So we also have so no so we, there's some there, so we also have uh, timing results on Edison and NERSC. So the OpenMP and MPI hybrid version of this code is running uh, has been benchmarked on Edison and NERSC and achieved about 80 percent efficiency on about 50,000 cores. And so and all of these codes are available on our Pixie website, which is can be seen here. And so I'll wrap it up. And thank you very much. <laughs>